Well, let's uh, turn for our text again to the uh, sixth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and at verse 13, which is just two words in the Hebrew language translated into four in the English, uh, but such an encompassing commandment. You shall not murder. We know it best, of course, as thou shalt not kill which has the advantage of retaining thou as you singular, because it is addressed to us all individually, but the disadvantage of using the word kill, which isn't as strong as this word, murder, and that is really what is conveyed by the Hebrew language. So we're coming again to this commandment, which is telling us not to take away human life unlawfully not to take it away unlawfully. And uh, the reason, of course, behind that we saw uh, last time, the reason behind it is because every single human being is stamped with the image of God. Now, certainly since the fall, that image is defaced because we don't share God's character anymore. But nonetheless, our souls live forever and are capable of being restored into God's fellowship and therefore even the most notorious sinner in the world today still carries the image of God upon them. If they come to faith in Christ they will be renewed into God's likeness as well in character but they have that image on their life. Now, we began this really by noting that human life can, of course, be ended lawfully because God has delegated that power to what is usually called the civil magistrate or we normally refer to as the state. And that was part of God's covenant with the earth in Genesis chapter 9. It followed the flood when God was renewing the earth, effectively recreating the earth after the destruction of it in the flood. And he establishes a a covenant with the earth on certain conditions. And one of these is that whenever someone sheds the blood of another person, then his own life is to be forfeit for that. Because, he says, man is made in the image of God. Now that undoubtedly has an allusion to the fact that before the flood there was violence, uh, killing, everywhere. And so to restrain that, the power of capital punishment is there. And so the state rightfully uses that power uh, when it carries it out in the name of God. And as well as uh, protecting the land from murderers and violence, the state also has that power uh, to protect the land from external aggression and violence. And that's why the soldier's calling is a a lawful calling and a a noble calling uh, because the soldier under the state is again empowered by God to kill lawfully. And really the way that some soldiers are being treated uh, is really quite terrible. Uh, The way that they suffer, lose limbs and are not properly cared for and every act that they do that might just fall without Uh, or outside of the uh, regulations for war is combed through um, and they they are in fear almost of trying to protect themselves or other people. All that uh, is because society is shifting away from the emphasis that God places uh, on human life and its importance. So soldiers should be prayed for. It's a noble calling. It doesn't certainly give license for abuse, but the occupation in which they're engaged is lawful. Even when the Roman soldiers came to John the Baptist asking what kind of evidence would indicate repentance, he he tells them to behave properly as soldiers. He doesn't tell them to leave the army. So we should always remember that. Um, But I want uh, today to turn to something else, and maybe some of you have recognized what it is in the light of our readings and our singings. Uh, I want to leave 
Uh, in connection with what I mentioned, there are lots of questions about what is a just war and, and so on, but I, I want to leave these to the side because they'll take us too far off our path. What I want us to do with the Lord's help this morning is to turn to areas where the state is intruding on uh, or violating uh, God's commands or intruding where it ought not, or indeed contradicting or setting up an alternative system to what God himself has appointed. And especially where the state is legislating for unlawful murder and making it lawful, calling certain kinds of murder good, uh, contrary to what the word of God says. And very often with this kind of thing, um, people recognize in their conscience that it is not right. But there is a gradual program of, uh, I, could not, I could only call it brainwashing really, uh, with which the media is in league, which gradually conditions people to begin to think that what is unlawful is actually lawful. Now that's nothing new. It's easier to do it in a day of mass media and social media. It's easier to do it, but it was always being done. I mean, Isaiah had to say in his own day, woe to those who call good evil and to call evil good. And uh, he was talking about the, the government of the land in particular, and indeed the prophets and the priests uh, who were in league with the rulers of the land in bringing about ungodly things. Now, nothing changes. Nothing changes. You see prominent churchmen today taking the side of governments who are passing unlawful legislation. And it is remarkable to see it, but... There again, we have it even in the Old Testament itself. And at first, you know, when it's being propagated, the media and indeed the government take what's called an even-handed approach to it, as though, well, some say this and some say that. But as time moves on, they dictate what the right position is, and somebody who is against it is in the wrong. You see that recently, for example, uh, with... Uh, same-sex marriage and things of that kind. When the issue was first raised, you would have balanced arguments presented in the media. Then before you know where you are, the right position to take was the one that was in favour of it. And the person who was opposed to it was advocating the wrong position. Now that is, that is a, a deliberate but subtle shift in order to gradually re-educate or reprogram the people or to brainwash the people into thinking that what is wrong is actually right, that light is actually darkness, and that evil is actually good. Now, the first example that I want to consider with you falls within the remit of this commandment, obviously. You shall not kill unlawfully, because it has become increasingly acceptable to kill human life in the womb, as though that was a lawful act of killing. In fact, it's become so acceptable that people are trying to push the boundary uh, at which it can be, within which it can be done lawfully, right up to the point of birth now is what people are advocating. And you'll notice in your um, intimation sheet that the SNP, sadly, at its most recent conference, has uh, pledged to make it a, a constitutional right in an independence, independent Scotland to have an abortion, uh, which is astonishing that such a thing could be a constitutional right in, in, a, in a country like ours, which signed the National Covenant. Quite remarkable. But that is how far we have fallen. Now, the idea of abortion, even to those who were in favour of it, was initially abhorrent. And some of those who argued for it did so reluctantly. But the, the way in which it's being advocated is now extremely different. But it's impossible to describe an abortion, really, with, without some kind of sense of horror. And when you think of a womb, um, you immediately associate a womb with uh, life and with nurture, uh, and indeed with safety. Uh, you think of all these things 
when you think of a womb. You think of every life inside there as being fearfully and wonderfully made, as the psalmist described it in Psalm 139. And to invade that space, for for another human being to invade that space with the instruments of death, with forceps, and with a vacuum, in order to tear apart that life and suck it up in a hoover and deposit it in a bag, is abhorrent to any right-thinking person where the grace of God at all still functions, even in its common sense. It's an obscenity, and it's a mark of a decadent and an evil culture where such a thing is tolerated and advocated as a fundamental human right. A fundamental human right to be torn apart limb from limb. Now, there's no point really in going over statistics except to say, it's enough just to say these brief ones, that since abortion was legislated in 1967, around 10 million human lives have been put to death inside the sanctuary of their mother's womb. 10 million. That's twice the population of this country. Every year in the United Kingdom, a city the size of Aberdeen is put to death inside their mother's womb. And if abortion is indeed murder, then the hospitals of our land are housing the biggest serial killers in the country. Most of you will know that the uh, most notorious serial killer in the UK is Harold Shipman, who was actually a doctor and who ended the lives of so many old people. His count pales into comparison. Uh, pales in comparison with those who take away uh, the human life inside the mother's womb. Now, of course, the question arises, is it murder? The answer to that is yes, it is murder. And it's murder simply because, as we saw last week, it is the human life that carries the image of God. And that life begins its existence at conception, and it ends its existence at death. And it is the human life that carries the image. And all the way through the Bible, the emphasis is on the human life. The Bible never gets diverted into questions of the soul and the body. Never. The Bible always assumes or states that the whole human being is present in the embryo. The whole human being is there from the moment of conception. That embryo doesn't need anything added to it to make it a human being. It is a human being. All it requires is nourishment and protection. You say, well, that's a big thing. Of course the a big thing. But what does a baby require? Nourishment and protection. The baby has inside it everything that it will be as an adult. It's all inside. It's programmed inside by God in its DNA so that it simply grows into what it is going to be. Well, the same is true just taken right back to embryo or, if you want, scientifically, the zygote. There, from the moment it is made, you have a human being. A distinct, individualised portion of human nature. The sperm is not a human being. The egg is not a human being. But the moment there is fertilisation, there is a human being. And from that moment, that being carries the image of God. To the point where the Holy Spirit can indwell that embryo, and be with that embryo throughout the whole process of its growth until it is born into the world and grows to become a man or a woman, just as the Spirit of God was with John the Baptist in the womb and, of course, with many another child in the womb too. It is a staggering thought to think that some of those who are put to death in the womb may be the Lord's people in the womb. Many of them may be the Lord's people, and they are being murdered. 
So the whole human being is in the embryo. The soul is in the embryo. The body is in the embryo. So it is not a potential human life. That's a very strange expression to say that it's a potential human life. It is a human life. Remember that. It's not potential. It is a human life. Now, if you think of the following examples in the Bible, these things come home to us very powerfully. And we've referred to them, I suppose, one way or another since we began. The last one there was in the psalm that we sang, where David says, My mother conceived me in guiltiness and in sin. Now, every time I give out that psalm to be sung, with the exception of this time, I didn't say it this time because I'm going to say it now, but always when I give that psalm out to be, to be sung, I make the point, just for clarification, that David is not making a statement about his mother. The reason I say it is because it's sometimes understood that that's what he meant, that uh, his mother was in a state of guilt when she conceived him. Now, that's not what he's stating. That, that's not his point. Um, as though he was conceived in sin, the sin being his mother. David, as most of you will know, was the youngest son in the family of Jesse. He was born and raised in a godly home with a godly mother and father. And I emphasize a godly mother too because the Bible tells us in a roundabout way that David's mother was a godly woman. In one of the Psalms, he, he says that, I am the son of your maid servant. Now by saying that, he is saying, that his mother was indeed a servant of the Lord. When he says, my mother conceived me in guilt and in sin, he's talking about himself. It's himself. From the point of my conception, he says, I was in a state of guilt and sin. Now, that can give rise to many questions in your mind in connection with um, original sin and things of that kind. Again, it would be too much of a digression to go down that way. All that we need to recognise right now is that David is saying that he possessed a fallen human nature right from the start. Right from the start. From the beginning, I was guilty. That's, that's the only human nature there is to have, by the way. Ever since the fall polluted our first parents, the only human nature you can inherit is a fallen one. That's why we are all sinful from birth. You're sinful from birth because you're sinful from conception. And you're sinful from conception because the only human nature that God can create stuff out of is fallen and sinful. There is no alternative. And when David says, my mother conceived me in guiltiness and sin, he's not actually mitigating his own sin. Now, you know the sin that's being spoken of. It's the awful, the terrible double sin of adultery and murder that David himself committed. And you well know how he went for a period of nine months trying to pretend that he wasn't really responsible for it. Or certainly that he wasn't the only person responsible for it. Or that he wasn't the person most responsible for it. And that there were mitigating circumstances. Because that's what we always do. That's what you do as a non-believer here. Today you have a thousand ways in which to mitigate the bad things in your life and to dress them up as being quite good, to justify yourself. And as a Christian here, you can lapse into that as David did, not coming face to face with what you're doing or what you are. But when David came to the place where he said, against thee, the only, have I sinned, and in thy sight done this ill, he's taking it, what you would say today, he's taking ownership of his own sin, which you need to do, and he's bringing it before God. And when he says, my mother conceived me in this, he's not saying, I couldn't help it. By the way, although I'm saying I, I did it, I couldn't help it, because this is what I was. That's not the spirit in which he's saying that. The spirit in which he's saying that is, is when I look at myself, he says, and when I consider wh what I've done, he says, I realize that this is me. This is me by nature. And this is me by nature all my life long. And this is everyone by nature all their life long. He's far from mitigating the, the, the matter. He's, 
He's accentuating it. How evil I am, he says. How sinful I am. I, I need your grace to keep me and to restrain me at all times. But I, I was conceived. Not something was conceived, which could later be called I when I came out of the womb. No, but I was conceived. I had a conception. I had a beginning point in my mother's womb when that embryo was made. The embryo of anything is the beginning of that thing. Not a potential, but the beginning of that thing. The second example is the one that we sang earlier in Psalm 139. Now, the words of that psalm are wonderful words. Whichever section of it you take, wonderful in different ways. But when he thinks of God's overshadowing care and protection over his whole life, uh, he's in awe at it. He's in awe at it and he's so deeply and profoundly thankful for it. How precious, he says, are your thoughts to me. But he goes right back into the womb. Right back into the womb before the individual members of his body came to assume a distinct appearance and distinct features. Back to when he was simply a substance. You formed, he says, my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. The Hebrew word for cover there actually means to weave together, which is an idea that should be preserved, I think, in the translation. You wove me together in my mother's womb. Now, you think of um, the fabric um, in your body. Think of the tissues. Uh, think of the muscle, the sinews. Think of the nerves. Think of the neurons uh, in the brain. And there is a weaving here. Right from the beginning, there is an intricate weaving in my mother's womb. I am, he says, fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearful in the sense that it produces awe in me to contemplate this weaving. And, he says, it is wonderful. Your works, he says, are wonderful. Now, I, I sometimes, I don't know, I, uh, I sometimes pick up on a thing in translation, and I, I can't help doing it, because I think um, there's, a, there's a version of the Bible called the Amplified Bible, which is a useful version, because after the words, it gives you in brackets nuances of meaning and things like that, that, that help you to understand the word better. See, what helps here is when he says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, your works are marvellous. The word for marvellous is another form of the word wonderful. So, so it's better, really, if you, if you would put it like, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, your works are wonderful. That preserves the connection. Now, tonight I want to consider Samson's weaving in the womb. But when the angel announced himself to Samson's father, to Samson's mother, I should say, which is important, he said, why do you ask after my name, seeing it is wonderful? And then we're told that wonderful did a wonderful thing by uh, ascending into heaven in the flame of fire in front of Manoah's eyes and his wife's eyes. Wonderful. He who was called wonderful did a wonderful thing. Now that's the idea that we've got here. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. In other words, in all of creation, we can say this. I mean, there are many fascinating things in creation. And um, As a young boy or a young girl or whatever, you, you discover how, how fascinating God's creation is and how the whole creation is woven together but in spite of the intricate weavings that that God has woven everywhere in the universe there is nothing comparable to the weaving of a human embryo nothing because there there is a spiritual nature which is literally incorporated brought into a, a corpse a, a person 
into a body woven together in such a way that we are in awe at the way in which this human soul interacts with the body in which it's housed. Nobody can separate them. The interaction between the two is so intricate, and yet in a breath, in a moment of time, God rips them apart. Takes a soul into glory or awfully condemns it into hell, but it will be reunited, rewoven again with the new body which the Lord makes for it. There is no weaving in the universe as intricate and as marvellous as that. So that being inside a mother's womb is the most wonderful work that God has created in the entire universe. And you're going to suck it out and put it in a waste paper basket. A human body and a human soul. My frame, he goes on to say, was not hidden from you. The word frame in the Hebrew is the bone. And he's referring to the skeletal structure. How it is, how it assumes solidity and is pieced and held together by God. When I was made, he says, again skillfully woven, skillfully woven within the womb, he goes on to say strangely, within the earth, or in the earth. Now, that is a bit of a mystery, but I think I maybe alluded to that when I uh, considered this psalm with you at communion. I, I think he's going back there to the fact of our original creation, and th that there's a sense in which the womb of the mother is replicating that. You'll remember that the Lord took the of the soil of the earth. That's a reminder to us that that was known from the beginning that that's what we are, dust. But he took that dust and when he breathed his own life into it, he skillfully wove it together and made the earth, the soil, made it into something marvellous and unique. And he says, I, I am still doing that. I am taking off the dust of the earth inside the darkness and the safety and the preciousness of a womb and I am creating another human life. He goes on to say, Psalm 139, verse 16, that your eyes saw my substance. That Hebrew word is embryo. Your eyes saw my substance before it took form, before it had a discernible human feature. Now you'll notice, you'll notice how the Bible is penetrating right to the heart of what he's doing and when he's doing it. People talk about, oh well, it's okay to take it away until, it, until we can see its arms and its legs, or until the, the neural tissue begins to clearly function. No, no. You saw my substance before it took shape or form. And, he says, how precious are your thoughts to me. Now, the thoughts that he's referring to there are the thoughts that God has of himself. Not the thoughts that he has of God. I'm conscious that we could use the expression like that. We could say, how precious are your thoughts to me? In other words, when I think of you, that is precious to me. But that's, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that these thoughts you have of me from the beginning... When you watched over me in my mother's womb, he says, how precious are these thoughts to me. You have cared for me from conception until now. And this formation of the child and this growth of the child is the work of God. Of course, a naturalist will think that it's all just natural. But we know that God supervises that growth, the shape it takes, the form it takes, the kind of soul you have, the kind of thinking person that you are, the shape of your body, God designed the whole thing. As he said to Jeremiah, when God was calling Jeremiah to preach, Jeremiah felt himself too young and too inexperienced. And God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He says, and I actually consecrated you uh, to be a prophet. Before I formed you, I consecrated you. Now that consecration there 
is not to be seen as a consecration that took place before Jeremiah had existence. In other words, in, in God's plan and purpose. Now God has that plan and purpose. And God foreordains whatsoever comes to pass. And centuries before Jeremiah was born, in that respect, God ordered that Jeremiah would be a preacher of the gospel. But the particular consecration that he's referring to there is the consecration that took place even before he had a form. In other words, right from the start, I made you in such a way that you would be a prophet. Which is a, a wonderful thing because it reminds us that God knows everything about us from the beginning and shapes us uh, to be what we are and what we will be. There was something in Jeremiah's conception, in the way that he developed in the womb, in the way that he came out with this particular uh, uh, gifts or abilities that meant that God's hand was upon him. That's what you will be. That's who you are. And that's true of us all. The hand of the Lord is upon us and he shapes and guides us and gifts us naturally and gifts us supernaturally for whatever it is he has us to do in life. And it doesn't matter what that is. In the home, in the family, in the village, in the town, in the city, it doesn't matter. God has all that from the moment of conception. But what about the Lord himself? When the angel came to Mary and said to her that you shall conceive, that's the key. You will conceive. She says, how? How? I've never known a man. The Holy Spirit, he says, shall come upon you. And the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Now here comes the creator of all things and he, he comes to this womb into which the seed of man has never come the seed of man has never come into this womb I'll probably I think refer to that tonight God willing into which the seed of man had never come and he's going to overshadow now that immediately brings before us uh, the creator God the God who brooded over the earth when it was in darkness and took life from it He's brooding over the womb of the Virgin. And from the moment of conception, that embryo is the Son of God. The Son of God in an embryo. Just as the Son of God was a fetus. Just as the Son of God was a child, a young boy, a youth, and a man. At every point, he was the Son of God. Had you put the forceps into Mary's womb, had you sucked out its contents, you would not have sucked out something that might have become Jesus of Nazareth. That is who he was. That was him. He would have put to death the Son of God 33 years before he was to die. So there's abundant biblical authority for protecting human life in the womb. And these arguments are easy to follow. We can't say they're difficult or they're problematic. The arguments against it are the sophisticated ones. And I mean sophisticated there in the literal sense, something that a sophist would come up with. Again, they're rationalistic and they're humanistic. And it's amazing how people are drawn aside by them that shouldn't be drawn aside by them. Sometimes, you know, that can be done by things like political affiliation. You become fanatical about a party, a political party. Let me just warn you not to become fanatical about political parties anyway. Let me just say that to you. Don't. Uh, you, you'll find that they lead you where you don't want to go. You'll find that they make you saying things that you never thought you'd said. Watch your affiliations. You are a Christian. That's your identity. You're a man or a woman in Christ. And don't give the identity away to political parties. And don't be fooled by any of them. I mentioned in, my, in the intimations what the SNP have now said that they will codify in a constitutional document for Scotland. But 
Does any party come out well on this kind of matter? No. The Labour Party, Keir Hardy, uh, from its conception, its own conception, and every single Labour MP subsequently, till certainly after the Second World War, would have been strongly pro-life. That party itself was birthed in non-conformist Christianity. And although they were liberal or sometimes near socialist in how they viewed the distribution of money, they were pro-life, they were pro-marriage, they were socially conservative. Absolutely so. Not anymore. Not anymore. But they wouldn't, those who founded it wouldn't recognise the morals of current labour. Conservative. Conserving what? That was a party that could be relied on, I suppose, at some point for conserving things that were to do with family life and uh, individual life, pro-capital punishment, things of that kind. Pretty much all of the most serious legislations that have come in against God's law have been passed by conservative governments, sad to say, because they were in power most of the time. Just go over it, you'll find it, and you'll be quite amazed at it. None come out of this well. And people who attach themselves too closely to parties find themselves in danger of propping up positions that they never thought they would and eventually come to believe in them. And I've seen good people go astray because of these things. What are these arguments? Well, you hear them all the time. It's my body. Well, a a woman would say. And therefore, it's my right to choose. Let me just give a couple of biblical responses to that. First of all, none of our bodies are actually our own, whether you are a woman or whether you are a man. They are not our properties in an absolute sense. As uh, Paul tells the Corinthians, uh, your body is not your own. God created it. God sustains it in being. And if you are a Christian, God has redeemed it so that your body has been bought again with a price. He's saying that in connection with committing sexual immorality. Um, and he's pointing to, this, to the sanctity of the body when the Holy Spirit especially dwells in it. So God owns you as your creator, and he double owns you as your redeemer. So you're not, you're not, you're not your own, actually, and I'm not my own. That, that trickles down to everything that we have in life. You, you've got £100,000 in the bank. Well, it's not yours, it's God's, fundamentally. You are a steward of that £100,000, if you're privileged to have that. You're a steward of it. You give an account to your maker of what you have done with it. And by extension, that is true of everything. You have a little boy, right? Yours? Yes and no. Ultimately, if you took that child for baptism and if you put the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit on that child, that is a recognition of prior ownership on the part of God. That that child is God's given to you to raise. Raise that child for me, God says. That's a reminder. Who created that child? Who ultimately owns that child? So we're to remember that all the time. Your body is God's primarily before you think of it as being your own. And that's one of the reasons why as Christians we think carefully about what we do with our bodies, what we expose them to, and so on. It belongs to the Lord. Second, even in a relationship of marriage, God tells both the husband and the wife to be careful how they think of themselves. And he tells them in terms of their physical relationship with each other, he says, not to deny each other a physical relationship because, he says, the husband uh, has the right over the woman's body and the wife has the right over the husband's body. Now, these are remarkable words. But that is exactly what he's saying, that when you come together as man and wife, Uh, you merge together in that way and you should not deny 
yourself to the other. He interestingly says it both to the husband and to the wife. So again, you think of ownership differently. But the second thing in connection with that is that the child is not actually the same body as the mother's body. I'm sure most of you know that a child has a different blood type to the parent. You'll also know that the child has a different immune system to the mother's immune system. That's because it's a different human being. Now God has ordained that every single child comes into this world through a woman. There's a reason for that which I might touch on tonight as well. But Every single child comes through a woman. Which says something about nurture as well as deeper theological truths. But the fact is that the body is different from the mother's body. That is a wonderful thing. And you'd think it would, it would be different. You'd think same blood type, same immune system. Not so. And in fact, strangely, people take that argument and they turn it the other way and say, very well then, it's a parasite. And I've often heard pro-abortion people describe what they call a clump of cells. I've heard it described as a tumour and I've heard it described as a parasite and that you are free to deal with it as you would a tumour or a parasite because it doesn't, it's not really a human being at that point. It is only potential. Now, strangely, well, as uh, G.K. Chesterton once said, he was a famous writer in Victorian times and beyond, sorry, after that. He was into the 20th century. But he said that when people lose um, God, that their thought disintegrates altogether. It's astonishing that people can view the loss of a, of a, a fetus, if you like, as a miscarriage which demands mourning and probably a funeral, while at the same time justifying the extraction of the same mass as something that can be tossed in a bin. Which is it? Is it a tumour? Is it a parasite? Or is it something precious and valuable and important, the loss of which is to be mourned and taken to the Lord for healing? Well, it's the latter. Whenever an embryo is formed in the womb, that is a soul. If in God's will, that, that will be a fully developed person in glory. A, a Christian who has lost a child can remember such a thing. That will be a fully developed person in glory. But you see, people who, people who move away from God's ground find themselves torn in two directions. That's why I refer to what's happening in Quebec, the, the statistics that they've measured in Quebec, where 20% of 23-week abortions at the 23-week limit, 20% are born alive. They're still living when they come out of the mother's womb. Some of them they send to a place where they can be cared for terminally. Others get sent to an incubator. Some live for three hours. And people don't know what they are. Do you, do you just sit and watch it dying for three hours? Do, do you hasten the process of death? Which is quite difficult, you see, when you come face to face with the fact that the thing in front of you is alive. What do you do with it? The irrationality of it is compelling. No one can decide. Do you fight hard to keep it? Or do you finish it off? These dilemmas only arise because people are ungodly. That's why. They are ungodly. If you are godly, even at the level of common grace, if, if that much of the knowledge of God was in your heart, you would know instinctively that the child is life. The child requires love and care and kindness, not being torn apart at any stage of its existence. It's not a tumour. It's a child. But others will say, well, even if it's not my body, strictly speaking, it's in my body and entirely dependent on me for life. And therefore, 
you choose to exercise the fact that the child is de entirely dependent for you on you for life as a reason why you should deny that child life? Is there any other sphere of life in, in which that argument applies? That because somebody is dependent on you for living, that you can exercise a right, therefore, to take that life away? I mean, imagine that. Imagine there's an old person. You don't need to imagine. There's an old person in a chair that can't feed themselves or look after themselves. They're entirely dependent on someone else doing that. Well, of course, I'm conscious that that is being used as an argument why you should end their life. Fair enough. Except it's not, and of course, I'll come to that on another occasion. But suppose you just take a child. It's a well-known fact that a human child is the form of life in this world that takes longest to attain to independence. I mean, you look at any animal around you even, and it's born, and within a couple of hours they're standing on their legs. Within a week or so, you'd never known it, it, the thing had been helpless at all. As a human being, it's so different. God has left the child in this basic state of utter dependence for a long, long time. You think of the child that the woman holds. That child can feed itself, it can clothe itself, it can do nothing for itself. And a woman is normally conscious of her desire to feed this child and to nourish this child and to nurture that child. You would never say to that woman, look, that baby is so dependent on you that you have a right to kill it. So why do you go back just a few weeks and say it's okay because the child is still enclosed in your stomach? It makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. The very dependence of the child is something that God has ordained to bring out the love in your own heart for that being which carries its image. How can you possibly abuse that into something else? Some people say the umbilical cord, the moment that's cut. Really? Really? These are just irrational arguments. But again, people will say, well, every child deserves to be loved and wanted. No child deserves to come into this world unwanted. Right? Okay. The flip side of that is that we should all want and desire the child. That's where you start with that. You, you don't use your lack of want for that child as a justification for killing it. Think deeper than that. Think wider than that. First of all, start with the fact that maybe we need to change. We need to change our attitude to children. We need to change our attitude to children who are currently unwanted. And we need to want them. God can give that kind of change of heart. A family is there to help. There are couples who desire to adopt and who are quite happy to have your child. Let me say if you are Christian parents and your daughter um, becomes pregnant, don't fall into the trap of thinking that this is the worst thing in your life and the worst thing in their life. It's not. I'm not excusing sin, but these things happen. And it's how you, how you deal with them that matters at the end of the day. It's how you deal with them. These things happen. Don't let your daughter feel that it would be the end of the world if such a thing did happen. Ask the Lord to bring good out of it. Don't create an environment where your daughter feels unloved or uncared for. Uh, you never know what God may do with that child. What happened was wrong, and that has its own repercussions. It may bring shame and things like that, but all our sin brings shame. All our sin brings shame. But shame's not the end of the world. The, the, what's worse than shame is trying to hide your shame in a fit of pride, as though nobody can have sin in their lives. You try and hide it as though you're so, pre, so supremely virtuous. We're not friends. None of us are above these things. But wait and see what God does with it. I can rattle off the top of my head, I think, the name of a good few ministers who were born as 
what were referred to as illegitimate children or out of wedlock, whom God raised to be preachers of the gospel. Just bear with it. Take the situation to the Lord and ask him to bring good out of it. Love your daughter and love the child. And if, as a woman or a girl, you find yourself in this kind of situation yourself, don't again think it's the end of the world. Don't make the assumption that your family won't uh, embrace you or embrace the child or that there's nowhere to go and no one to turn to. These things happen. It is a sin, but these things happen. Take it to the Lord and you'll never know what the Lord will do with it. He can turn anything around by your repentance and by the power of his own grace. I was thinking in connection with this and I I couldn't find where I had read this. Um, But it's to do with a preacher of the gospel who's still living, who's well known. He sadly kind of deviated off in the last few years a bit. But I don't want that to take away from the strength of what I'm going to say. It's about a, a young girl in Texas in the 1940s. She was a young black girl and uh, she was alone and penniless. And um, she finally found work looking after this old man in his house. And one day, and this is the worst case scenario, and I'm openly saying it is the worst case scenario, she was raped by the alcoholic son of the man that she was working with. And she couldn't believe it when she discovered she was pregnant and she tried as hard as she could uh, to somehow get the child aborted. It wasn't easy in Texas in the 1940s to have the child aborted. She then came to the conclusion that she wanted to kill herself. And just like I'm saying, abortion is never your answer. Suicide is never your answer either. We'll, We'll come to that. It's never your answer either. And as she was contemplating it, It was as though she felt a powerful urge to pray. And she did start praying because she knew about God. And she felt a strong conviction that she should just carry the child. But she felt she couldn't keep the child. And she she looked out through some contacts, a Christian couple who would be willing to take the child. The Christian couple took the child. She took it to its full term. She delivered, all of which was difficult. And no one's going to deny that it was all difficult. But they took the child, and the child grew, and the child became a preacher of the gospel. God can take good out of evil. He can do that. The answer is never to try and sort it out in our own sin. My time has gone, but I just want to briefly mention something else. Because people will raise that possibility, too. They will say, well... What about cases of rape? Well, let me just say to you that cases of abortion due to rape amount to 0.5% or less of all abortions. And you say, well, what if the mother's life is in danger? Can I say to you there again that cases of abortion due to the mother's life being in danger are less than 05 also of abortions. So suppose, suppose you were to allow both of these, which I don't advocate, certainly certainly the first, you've still got less than 1% of abortions. You know, when someone says to you, oh, what about where a mother's life is in danger, you feel that the way they're talking, that's those 70% of the cases. It's extremely rare. In fact, abortion itself is a far more dangerous procedure for a mother than anything else that is liable to come upon her. These are not the answers. I think if a mother's life is in danger, that's a decision for the parents. If a mother is terminally ill, she may well say, please spare my child. Just uh, I've, I've had some life. My life's going to come to a close soon. Please let my child live. Is that unthinkable? Greater life, love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. May it not be the case sometimes that a mother may wish to lay down her life for her child? Maybe. But that is a mother and father's decision, not a state's decision. But in all these things, it's important not to let little grey areas 
just muddy the whole picture for us. The key is, do we love life? And do we love those whom God has made in his own image? It struck me when I was um, thinking about how irrational people can be about these things. A lot of abortion now is done on the basis of sex selection. Closing with this, like, in some cultures, um, if they discover that the child's going to be a girl, they go ahead with an abortion. Now, I would have thought, normally, that the pressure group screaming most loudly against this would be feminists. Feminists don't say a cheap. Because to say there's a problem with that means that you're giving some kind of personhood some kind of dignity or status to that fetus in the womb. And they can't afford to do that because of the bigger picture, which is the right to do with the body as they see fit. So the gender gap is now 200 million plus, and it's widening all the time because people want girls less than they want boys, which is a shame and a crime and a sin itself. But that's a fact, and the people you expect to scream don't scream at all. Because at the end of the day, godliness is rational and sin is irrational. One of the words used in the New Testament to describe sin is anomia, which means lawlessness. And that is exactly what sin is, lawlessness. May the Lord help us to love the unborn, to pray for the unborn, and to pray for those who are carrying the unborn, whatever grief and trouble they feel that they take it to the Lord and that they choose life.